Coming up, I look at the Codemasters CD collection. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And I continue running my pretend business. Let's get on then. Tapes. Great. A low cost means to save and load data from your spectrum. But they're very slow. Microdrives. Better, but not much storage per cartridge. Disk drives. Plenty to choose from, but expensive. And most are non standard. In 1989, Codemasters decided to try something different CDs. They released the Codemasters CD Games Pack 30 games on a single standard CD. As we all know, there were no CD drives for the Spectrum, so let's look at how this worked. Inside the box, we get the CD, a cable, some instructions, and a tape. Now, the CD isn't a normal data CD, as you may expect, it's an audio CD, but we'll get onto that later. The cable will work on the computers that this was released on, the Spectrum, the Amstrad and the Commodore. The Amstrad version never got released, as they say they had trouble with things, and by the time it was ready, they realised that the Spectrum and Commodore versions were not as popular as they'd hoped. The first thing then, I'll need a CD player. This one should do. Next I'll need a Kempston joystick interface. I'll use the DivMMC Enjoy, not only for the joystick port, but so I can load the special loader, initially supplied on tape, much faster. You can also use a Sinclair type joystick using a plus two or plus three. First we connect the cable to the joystick port and the other end to the CD player. Next we load the tape, or in this case I'll use the DivMMC. We're presented with a nice little menu and here you have a chance to set the volume level of the CD player. With the disc in you select track one, which is the volume test, and adjust the volume until the border is green. Right, we're ready to try and load a game. First though, a benchmark. I loaded 3D Starfighter via a real tape player, and this took 4 minutes and 47 seconds, give or take a second or two. Now, from the CD, we just pick the track, in this case number 9, pressed play, and we're off. And the game loads in 48 seconds. A decent change from the tape, and a lot faster. One interesting discovery that I made whilst listening to the audio track, and don't ask why, but you can hear the sampled voice from the game. Here it is, but I warn you, the loading sound sounds very much like a dentist drill. The process wasn't error free, and sometimes a game didn't load, and sometimes a game crashed at the end, but I would say 90% of the time the game loaded fine. The 30 games included are a fair amount of the Codemasters catalogue, including Dizzy, Treasure Island Dizzy, Fast Food Dizzy, Bigfoot, Jet Ski Simulator, Grand Prix, and many more. When you finish playing a game, you hold down the Q, U, I, and T keys, and it goes back to the menu. This means that each game has been modified to recognise those keys and allow you to go back to the loader so you can carry on. A nice little addition. Codemasters publicity department went into overdrive when they released this, with many magazines running competitions to win one and also reviewing it. Computer and Video Games gave it a fair review, pointing out that for those that didn't quite understand it, you can't actually save data to the CD, only read from it. Hmm, interesting. They recognised the potential though, offering ideas of multi-load games with digitised speech and graphics. Sinclair User also covered it. They gave it a two-page spread, with images that were not really fully explained. This picture shows a DAT tape and what looks like a Commodore 64 disk drive. In the article they do mention that Codemasters used DATs when making the CDs, but nothing else. They suggest this format may deter pirates though. Not only is CD copying difficult, remember this was 1990, but you also need to make the lead, because inside the plug is some electronics. Crash covered it in issue 73 and summarised by saying that if you didn't have all of the games, you'd be getting over £90 worth of software for just under £20. They were a bit dubious though, saying it could be a short-term sensation, which fails due to lack of support. Well, they got that bit right. However, they loved the idea, and hoped Codemasters would move forward and getting more of their games onto disc. Yor Sinclair also reviewed it, saying the system had enormous potential, 
and Codemasters were to be congratulated for coming up with an idea and technology to make it happen. They also suggested that games could be written specifically for it and have masses of data loading to play. Sadly, it was not a success though, and the standard Codemasters wanted to set just never took off. Many Spectrum owners had, if not already, jumped over to the 16-bit machines by this time, and there just wasn't a market for it. It did work really well though, and I could see other companies jumping on the bandwagon and releasing mega compilations, if only it had been brought to market sooner, maybe 1985, and that would have been something brilliant. What's on the CD, and how is it faster than tape? Well, as mentioned before, the CD is an audio CD, and not a data CD. CDs have a cleaner signal and less prone to drift and wow and flutter and all those other things you get with tape. This means that the baud rate for the data can be increased, along with some trickery, and this allows for much faster loading. They use the Kempston joystick as well, to help with the loading speeds, and the fact that you don't have to reset your spectrum when you want to change games makes things a lot quicker anyway. You've already heard what a typical audio track sounds like. Yes, it's almost identifiable as a spectrum loading sound, but a little bit different. Each game is also recorded twice on the CD as a failsafe. One question I was thinking is, could I replicate the game encoding by speeding up a normal game? Well, the answer is no. When you load the Codemasters game, you have the loader in memory first, then it loads a normal headerless block, which then kicks in the super fast version. So you would have to have a special version of the game with the compressed and speeded up loading data. A bit sad, because I thought I was going to try and make a CD with some of the games on. A great idea then, that was well implemented, but just too late to make an impression on the market. While we're here, let's review one of the games on the CD, ATV Simulator. This was originally released in 1987, and later on the CD compilation in 1989. ATV, or All-Terrain Vehicle Simulator, has you riding what would be known today as a quad bike. There are six courses increasing in difficulty as you go. The landscape and obstacles change, as does the background colour, to depict areas such as sand dunes, grass, ice and jungle. You can slow down and speed up, raise and lower your front wheels, and do small bunny jumps, and all of these together help you get over the various objects and obstacles in your way. As you head off, left to right, the hills, rocks and other items appear and you have to work out the best way to get over them. If you get it wrong, like I did most of the time, you fall off the bike and have to run back and jump back on it to carry on, which is a bit of a strange mechanic really, and at one stage I just couldn't get back onto the bike at all. I did manage to get a fair way through the levels without cheating, but again, later I had trouble getting back on the seat. The position of the bike just made it very difficult. The graphics, as you can see, are nice, but the backgrounds are a bit sparse, and sound is used quite well with a good engine sound, but Codemasters use the same music that they do in several other of their games. The playing area for one-player games is very small at the top of the screen, but as a bonus, you can have two-player simultaneous play, if you can find a friend. Gameplay, well, I can see what they were trying to achieve, and they nearly managed it. Maybe if I could get that jump mechanic working properly, which I really struggled with and could never actually use it. It's a game to try then, if you like these sorts of things. And remember, it was only one ninety nine when it was released. So for that, it's a fairly good buy, or would have been.
Rise from your grave. Altered Beast was released into the arcade in 1988 by Sega. It was a typical side-scrolling beat-em-up with a slight difference. The player could change into other beasts by collecting power-ups. The large colourful sprites, good sound and scrolling landscape made it an attractive looking game. So how would the Spectrum version compare? Released by Activision in 1989, the game, set in ancient Greece, actually doesn't do too badly. The graphics are really well done with the main character that is large and for once not monochrome. The zombies and dogs attack thick and fast and with many moves it's time to fight your way to victory. The story, yes there is one, is that you have to rescue Athena and that's as much story as you need really for this type of game. You can jump, crouch, punch and kick, and later on fire projectiles. When you hit a zombie on the first level, their limbs fly off just like the arcade, and the sound effects are okay, mostly though covered by the music. When you come across certain types of rocks, these can be smashed in search of items. As you progress, if you can, you change into other beasts, a wolf and a griffin for example, and a whole new set of enemies appear with each passing level. At the end of each level there's a boss to beat and these are very difficult. The background scenery is well drawn but does scrolling character squares. At first, you don't notice this, but at times, the game screen is empty and you just stand there with the background scrolling very jerkily, which is a bit off-putting. Gameplay-wise, it's fairly easy at first and you can make decent progress, but things do get a lot harder the further you get. This is a multi-load game, with different scenery and music for each level. The graphics are really well done and quite impressive really. Now, I'm not very good at beat-em-ups, but we'll certainly give them a try now and again. I got to see a lot of the game, probably about 50% based on the RZX playback. But when the game ended, it just seemed to lock up. Because it was a multi-load, I suspect you had to reboot and start again. A bit of a pain really. The instructions say that when this happens, you turn the tape over to side B, Rewind and press play. I tried this, but nothing happened. If you're a beat-em-up fan then, then this is one you should definitely try out. This is Stars 2 Gummy, released by Kaz29 in 2022. This great little platformer has a really good intro sequence. and a game mechanic you'll find interesting and challenging. You control the game using just the space key. Your character continually moves and you have to complete each screen by collecting the fuel pod and then entering the transporter, which sounds simple but it certainly gets you thinking with your character continually moving.
Each screen has its own challenges, and the graphics and sound are very good. A great game, definitely worth trying, although I had real trouble with later sections. It was still worth playing to try and see if you can get any further. In the previous episode, I gathered the hardware required to run my mythical small business. Now it's time for some software. As my new little business is about selling products, then I will need some kind of stock control or database application to keep track of what I have, how much it costs, and if I need to order any more. There are two main options here. One is a database, and the other is a stock control system. Now there are many databases for the Spectrum, but only a few stock control programs that I know of, and I think a dedicated application would be better. The first consideration is compliance with microdrive or disk, and that narrows it down a bit. I looked at two, Busycom and Plus80 Stock Manager. After trying them both, I decided to use the latter. This program not only covers stock management, but also invoicing and printing, which is handy. To get this onto disk, you first need to set it up though. I have to enter the starting number of invoices, so let's go with one. Let's pretend it's 1985, January the 1st, and my business is about to start. and then the company name and address. I'm going to call my business ZX Shed in homage to an old PDF magazine. I then have to select which printer we're going to use. Let's go for option two. I may have to select other later on if nothing works, but we'll give it a try. And finally, you set the height of the paper you're going to use for your printouts. I initially set mine to 10, but later changed it to 11. Now at this point, the manual recommends you save to microdrive, so all future loads can be done that way. Selecting option 8, save new cartridge to microdrive, I hit a problem. Despite this working fine in an emulator, it fails on my setup and I get this error. Looking at the listing, it seems to be trying to erase a file before it saves it out again. And obviously, because this is a first setup, that file doesn't exist. Now I've no idea why this worked in an emulator, but not here. Anyway, I needed to fix this before I could carry on. After a lot of messing about and rewriting bits of the program, I finally managed to get it loading and saving to disk. So now we can start adding some games to it. The system has a maximum of 600 items. That's a bit limiting if you plan on taking over the world. Luckily though, my business will be dealing with less than that, mainly because I don't want to spend days entering all the games into it. I can now enter all the games that I plan to sell along with a selling price and minimum stock order. This is a long process, but eventually I have enough to start with, about 60, and I've marked them all as being out of stock because I haven't ordered them yet. Once this is done, however, you only need to add new titles as they're released. Another feature of the package is that you can set reorder levels. Originally I didn't do this, so I had to go back. Setting the reorder level of all the products to one, that means if the quantity in stock gets below one, you can print out a reorder list, and that will tell you which games you need to order, because you've got none in stock to sell. The reorder levels can be shown on screen by inputting a range again, or for convenience, you can print them out. With this all set up, I can save it all to disk, because the program is microdrive compatible, remember? And of course, I made the changes to make it work properly. Right, let's print out a stock list. You can view this on screen by entering a range from one to however many games you've got, or you can print it out. Ah, the sounds of an old Doc Matrix printer. 
Now this printout is very handy because when you receive your games from the distributor and you want to add them to your stock, you are asked for the item number and here they all are printed out. Now we have a decent stock management program, in the next episode I'll look at trying to find some suppliers and buying some games. The invoicing elements of this package will be dealt with later, once I have something to sell. This is Don't Panic, released by Firebird in 1985. The game has you controlling a droid that has to round up various radioactive items in the loading bay and get them onto the ship. Because they're radioactive, you have to use your laser to move them as well. And if that wasn't enough, there's a monster roaming about that you have to avoid. The game's screen has four platforms that can be moved between using the magenta lifts or stairs or whatever they are. As you shoot and push more items along, they will fall or move towards the waiting ship. Eventually it begins to rise until all items have been collected and then it takes off for another planet. The game is harder than it looks. That monster just keeps homing in on you and moves faster than you and this often leads to frustration. You have to try and lure it onto a different platform and then run back to collect the other items, but it's soon back on your trail. If it's on your platform, well it's just a matter of time before it catches you really because you can't outrun it. The only thing you can do is try and head towards a lift, but that's not always possible. The scrolling made my eyes hurt too, but the graphics are okay generally. The idea is good, but I think it could have been much better with a few more tweaks. Maybe like disabling the monster if you shoot it a few times, giving you enough time to get away. Or maybe even random movements rather than it just homing in on your position. Sound is okay, but nothing special. And we have to remember this is a 16K title. game I did not enjoy playing at all then, even though I somehow managed to complete the first level. And then it just gets harder, oh dear. So what are we talking about today Paul? Today we're going to talk about games and completing games and whether completing a game ruins it or improves it in any way. So first question is have you completed many games Paul? I've completed probably six, seven, eight games something like that. I couldn't reel them all off off the top of my head but you've got things like Fred, Adventure 1, Timegate, things like that. Oh Ant Attack as well. Oh and Jetpack. Let's not forget Jetpack. I completed that but that I completed yeah. that many many years after I got it. So I've completed 180, Pajama Armor, Harrier Attack, but that's easy, Alienate, Trans Am, Manic Miner, Antiquity Jones, particularly good game, School Days, Attic Attack, Rex Port 1 and 2, Night Law. When you've played a game and finished it, do you think, well, I'm never going to play that again because why should I have completed it? Or do you think, I can't wait to play that game and try something different? There are two games I've completed that I have said I will never complete again. One is Jet Set Willy 2, just because it is so damn hard. The other is Jack and the Beanstalk, because it's just too hard. And it's just too much of a terrible game, and it's, yeah. With games, some games come with different skill levels. Do you think that improves things? So let's take, for example, Timegate. That's got, I think it's got five skill levels. And the higher the skill level, the more jumps in time you have to go back. So the game takes longer. Do you think something like that helps with that? I think it doesn't it help. Well, in, my opinion, it, in my opinion, it helps because if you play a time gate on the easiest level, you only, you've only got to find something like three time gates to complete the game, and for yeah. each level you go, you've got to find a further time gate. So it does extend the play. Yeah, I would think it would help because you can do like a short one and 
kind of get your eye in, as it were, and then do a longer one. Right, and and there are obviously there are other elements as well, like random things in games. So as an example, Maziax um, generates a random maze, um, and Attic Attack, the game that you're, again that you've completed, also has sort of semi-random placements of items. Yeah, well, the the keys. So the all of the all of the items, the general items, other than the key, are always in the same place. The the three parts of the key are randomly placed. Does it deter from the game if you want? If you go back and play it again, do you think um, I'm only doing this you know, just for the sake of it, or do you do it to as a method of relaxing? Some I do. So Jet Set, the three games I regularly complete are Jet Set Willy, Alienate, and Night Law, just because I want to be able to keep my hand in. Because if I st- if I stopped doing them, I wouldn't be able to. If I didn't play them for three or four years and went back, I wouldn't be able to complete them anymore. And I like being able to complete those games. One that I occasionally go back to is Star Quake. If I want to complete Star Quake again, I would have to relearn the game. So it's like having it would be like having the new challenge again. And what about adventures? If you if you complete an adventure, do you go back and play it again, like The Hobbit? Or I did complete The Hobbit back in the day, and every now and then I would go back and play it again and see if I could complete it. But the the Hobbit has random elements in it. I mean, the it Hobbit. Does, yeah. I think the Hobbit. It's possible for the random elements to mean you can't complete the game after a certain number of turns have gone. There was the, the, the famous urban myth whereby somebody played it and when they got to the um, the gold they'd found that Gandalf had stolen it and run off with it or something. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I think what? in the, that game The Hobbit that could actually happen. I think, so. if, I think if you'd played all the way through The Hobbit and when you got to the final treasure and found that Gandalf had nicked it, you, you'd be pretty annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, about, what about flipping it then? What about does not completing a game ruin it? One of my favourite games for the Spectrum, Bald's Tale, I never mm. completed, but absolutely adored playing it. Played hours and hours and hours and got loads of fun and satisfaction out of it. So I don't think you have to complete a game to get a lot of enjoyment from it. Are there any games you've completed that you go back to again and again? Uh, Jetpack, definitely I keep going back to. Adventure 1 I keep dropping in and out of, and I know I'm never going to finish it. That's strange. I load a game up that I know I'm definitely not going to complete, and I do it for familiarity. Does completing games ruin them for you? Uh, no. Um, there are some games that I would like to complete, like Attic Attack. I, if I completed Attic Attack, I probably wouldn't play it again. So, does completing a game ruin it? What's the answer? I suppose, it's, for me, it's mostly no, but on the very rare occasion, yes. <laughs> and that doesn't really answer anybody's question. I think I'd agree with that. For me, it is definitely mostly no. And on a very rare occasion, yes. 